Hello, Mike. Thank you. And thank you, all you who are listening, to another episode of Broken Bread, where we are studying my book that I wrote some years ago, and we are revisiting it to dig a bit deeper and go a bit wider and uh, generally improve, I hope, what we had to say there. Now, I owe you an apology and Mike too, because the last time I gave you Mike's URL, I gave you a wrong, fictitious URL. Mike Coles is from New Life Radio, based at Exeter, and his URL where you can get copies of these studies is newliferadio.co.uk. And Mike and myself, Ron Bailey from BibleBase.com, we work together to bring you these studies week by week, and for me it's a delight to work with Mike, and it's a delight to go through these things again. I love this theme. You may have gathered this as we go through it. I didn't expect we were going to spend anything like this amount of time on it, but um, there's more yet, I think. There's more yet. Let's see how we get on. This is study 48, which I've entitled Judaism's Baptisms. Study 8, Judaism's Baptisms. Last time we looked at Zechariah's expectation and what I call the gospel according to Zechariah. And he was a priest and on one special, very special occasion, a prophet. Let's take a look at what others of his day were expecting. Often the priests were Sadducees, not believing in miracles or angels or resurrection. Zacharias was clearly not a Sadducee, although they were the majority in the Sanhedrin. There were other sects within Judaism. The most uh, well-known one, I suppose, to us were the Pharisees. They were the most conservative group. And there's another group, not mentioned in scriptures, but known as the Essenes. So there were three of them. There were the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes. And we have enough evidence in the scriptures themselves to get a feel for the hot religious topic of the day. And it may surprise you. Let's take a deep dive into the world of Judaism's baptisms. So, I'm going to read, first of all, from Hebrews. I'll just read it. I want you to listen for the phrase, the doctrine of baptisms, with an S on the end for the plural. For though by this day you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, or of eternal judgment. And this we will do, if God permits. Now, there was a man named J.N. Darby who was one of the leaders, early leaders of the Christian Brethren, and uh, he was really quite a scholar in all kinds of ways. And he produced um, a Bible that became known as the J.N. Darby Bible. And it's, it, I, I would say it's based strongly in many ways on the 1901 American Standard Version. But it has some of his own emphases in there as well. Listen to this. This is part of that same passage. Wherefore, leaving the word of the beginning of the Christ... Let us go on to what belongs to full growth, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith in God, of the doctrine of washings and of imposition of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do 
if God permit. Now, did you notice that he's gone from the doctrine of baptisms, which is the New King James Version and the Old King James Version, and he's gone for doctrine of washings. And the American Standard Version follows him and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgments. And many more modern versions have gone in that direction, and I think with good reason. This word that's translated baptisms in the Old King James Version and has been followed, I tempted to say blindly, by um, the, the New King James Version, is not baptisms at all. It's washings washings it's the word baptismos and it means the act of washing and it has special reference to purification and i've put some notes here um in my notes so that you can look it up and find about more about it but uh, listen to it you'll hear it used here in mark's gospel chapter 7 and verse 4 when they come from the marketplace they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. There's that word washing. That's the same word that we have in Hebrews, atismos, baptismos. Now, if you think about this, you're not going to baptize a couch, are you? These couches, incidentally, were the long forms that people would lie on when they had their meals together such as the uh, the lord's supper that was on couches which is why someone like john could lay his head on the chest of the lord jesus you're not going to baptize a couch this has to do with washing this has to do with ceremonial religious cleansing of items which are to be used for god's service and for people who are obeying what God is doing. So, in the, that, that you've got it there. And it says, um, for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. So that's washing. But when we come into this other one, we've got this doctrine of baptisms. Okay, let's see if we can do a deep dive now for some context. Context, context, context. This is my little mantra. It's really just kind of repeating the truth, I think. I hope this is established now that when we're doing Bible study, as much as we can, it really does help to understand who was speaking and who was listening. In other words, who was the writer and who were the recipients? And what was the context? What was the circumstance? What was the event? What was the occasion that caused this letter to be written to these people or this gospel to be written to these people? So we're going to try and do that now. And I think one of the ways we can do that is if we kind of break down one of the divisions in the chapters and go from the end of John chapter 2 straight in to the beginning of John chapter 3. In the end of chapter twenty, chapter 2 and verse 23, it says, and I'm, I'm going to use a derby again for this. When he was in Jerusalem, at the Passover, at the feast, many believed on his name, beholding his signs which he wrought. But Jesus himself did not trust himself to them, because he knew all men and that he had not need that any should testify of men, for himself knew what was in man. Did you notice that? But Jesus himself. Okay, this is what they call a conjunctive participle. It, it, it joins two halves of a sentence, but in the other sense, it, it, it has what they call an adversative effect. It makes a distinction. It, it, it stops your line of thought, uh, brings it to a screeching halt, and then adds something maybe that you didn't expect to follow on from the sentence. It's a, it's a kind of a mild form of our but, which means this is different to what I'm saying before. Okay. Um, it, it, it's really, it should be translated most often. It should be translated but. 
can be translated and can be translated now. But its real essence is but. Okay, I don't know why I've read all that. Well, let me read on to the end of this little section that the chapter divisions have broken up. I'll go back to verse 23. When he was in Jerusalem, at the Passover, at the feast, many believed on his name, beholding his signs which he wrought. But Jesus himself did not trust himself to them, because he knew all men, and that he had not need that any should testify of man, for himself knew what was in man. But there was a man from among the Pharisees, his name Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. That break ought never to have been here. It's contrasting Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, with the general run of the religious people of the day, who had added all kinds of additions, accretions, obscurities to things. I call them that because they obscure often the real essence of what God was saying. Uh, but Nicodemus wasn't of that ilk. He wasn't like that. Although he was of the strictest form of the Pharisees, like Paul, um, the Pharisee, um, yet uh, he was not one who kind of followed all their ways, clearly. So he, there's a statement here that Jesus didn't commit himself, didn't trust himself to them, because he knew all men, and that he did not need that any should testify of man for He himself not knew what was in man, but there was a man, can you see the emphasis? But there was a man from among the Pharisees, his name Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And then we've got this wonderful, fascinating conversation. I'm, I marvel at the way in which the gospel writers are able to recreate an atmosphere of obviously it's that special enduing of the Holy Spirit. But often in just a few words, they're able, if we pay attention to it, to wonderfully give you an atmosphere, a feeling, um, the mindset of the people who are part of the conversation. So let me listen to this, uh, read you this again. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to him by night and said to him, We know. Now let's pause a minute. Who is the we here? He's speaking to Jesus. I'll illustrate why in a little moment I'm convinced that the disciples or some of them were there as well. Maybe others were there as well. <clears throat> but there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, you see that mark of respect? Now, Nicodemus was a very highly regarded rabbi of his day. And one that would people would kind of re refer to and revere very highly. This man comes to Jesus, who is a, I don't say this in a disparaging way, but who was a young upstart, who was a very much the new kid on the block. Um, just in his early 30s, not like Nicodemus, who was probably getting on by this time. But, but he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Who does he mean by we? Does he, does he know that amongst the Pharisees even, there were a group of people who recognized that Jesus was not an upstart, that he was not a deceiver, but that he was a teacher sent from God. For no one, he says, can do these signs that thou doest, except God be with him. So Nicodemus obviously knows about these signs. He's investigated them as well as he's able. He knows that there are others with him. So there were some among the Pharisees who were upright men, people like Nicodemus, people like Paul. We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered, and you may say, what kind of answer is this? That because that wasn't a question. This is just that was just an introduction. 
But as we say in our day, Jesus often cuts to the chase. He, he says to Nicodemus, uh, Jesus answered and said to him, and he precedes what he says by this Jewish way of really emphasizing the importance of what he's saying. Amen, amen, he says. That's the Jewish word. Amen, amen. Truly, truly, I say to thee. Now, he's, if he was pointing, he would put his finger now on Nicodemus's chest. I say to thee. This is a direct conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, but there are onlookers. And I'll show you why I say that in a moment. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except one, actually that's the word you, except you be born again. And you'll notice that it, it switches from thee to you. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except you be born anew. Now, this is one of, I think, our great losses in the development of the English language, that we've lost these and those. So we've lost the second person singular, uh, thee and thou and thy and the rest of it. But it's here in this version of the scripture here that I'm reading from. This is actually from the American Standard Version in this time. i read it again, and I'll try and emphasize it by putting a couple of words into it. Verily, verily, I say to thee, Nicodemus, except all of us here, all of you here, be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, that's a real conversation stopper, as they say, but it didn't stop Nicodemus. He said, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say unto thee, and he does it again, except someone be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said to thee, ye must be born again. Now there's a, a classic kind of, in my English Bible, these two words sit next to one another. Marvel not that I say to thee, ye. Now thee means you personally. You means all of you. Marvel not that I said unto you personally that all of you must be born anew. So, who was the all of you? Well, the disciples, or some of them at least, maybe others too. You must be born anew. The wind blows where it wills, and thou hearest the voice thereof, but knowest not whence it comes, and whither it goes, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, I see this man struggling to wanting to understand what this young rabbi is teaching, willing to listen to him, wanting to understand the implications of what he's saying. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. All of you may must begin. The wind blows what it wills, and you hear the sound thereof, but knowest not whence it comes and whither it goes. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered, and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou the teacher of Israel? That's probably an implication that he was one of the leaders of the Pharisees in the Sanhedrin, the ruler of the Jews. Nicodemus answered and said, and How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Art thou the teacher of Israel, and understandest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that which we know. Now, do you remember how Rabbi Nicodemus opened this conversation? He came unto him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know. Now, Jesus says, we speak that which we know. I don't know where Nicodemus had his information from. I know where Jesus had his information from. He'll explain it now. If I told you of earthly things and you believe not, 
and he's speaking to all of us, he's using the ye again, the plural. We speak that which we know and bear witness of that which we have not have seen, and all of you receive not our witness. If I told all of you earthly things, and all of you do not believe, how shall all of you believe if I tell all of you of heavenly things? <laughs> um, so now he's speaking to a group here. But Nicodemus is part of that group. And no one has ascended into heaven, but he that descended out of heaven. That's where his information came from. Even the Son of Man who is in heaven. And then he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that all whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. I think, I've thought a lot <laughs> about this, I've considered it. I think probably that's the end of our record of the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. I think it's very likely that the next little section actually comes as a result of John, the Gospel writer, inspired by the Holy Spirit, who adds his comment to what Nicodemus has said. But it's vital because, and I want to come onto this at another time perhaps, because this ends at John chapter 3 verse 15. Now you all know, we all know John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world. And I think it's John's addition in the power of the Spirit to this event and this conversation that he records. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. And I'll tell you why I think this is important. There are one or two places in the New Testament where there's just a sentence like this, and it defines a word. Jesus spoke of the people who lived in Capernaum, in Bethsaida. And he said to them that they had not believed. They had not repented. And it gives us, and he said, the men of Nineveh repented. So if you want to know what Jesus needs by repentance, you need to go back and thoughtfully read chapter 3 of Jonah. And you'll find Jesus' definition of repentance. Here, in this sentence, you'll find Jesus' definition of faith. Believing. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth. It's an interesting phenomenon that John never uses the noun faith. He always uses the verb. And most often, or very often, he uses the verb in a particular one, which really would better be translated, the believer. So that the believer in him might have eternal life. He's not talking about an event. He's talking about a process. Someone who continues to believe. Faith that lasts. Faith that stands the tests. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. John has a unique way of speaking about things he he speaks in of jesus and his kingdom jesus says in john chapter 18 my kingdom is not of my my kingdom is not of this world my kingdom if it were of this world my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but no, my kingdom is not from here. In that sentence, he repeats the phrase, my kingdom, in his conversation with Pilate, three times. But the first time he speaks about the kingdom is actually, in John's Gospel, is actually in this passage from John chapter 3. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except one be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter 
The second time into his mother's womb and be born, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except one be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Those are the only times in John's Gospel that Jesus uses the phrase, the kingdom of God. He speaks of seeing it. He speaks of entering it. It's, it's an amazing beginning of a theme which is really so vital. Later on, he'll speak about my kingdom. And you know that when he was in the upper room, it's recorded in Luke, that he says, um, I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So he makes it very clear that access to the kingdom of God is as a result of seeing, that's appreciating, and entering it. Now, the reason that this is such a stark thing is, and this is what I want to bring out, is that Nicodemus thought he was already in the kingdom of God. Because that was standard Jewish teaching that all Israel had been saved. That all Israel were in the kingdom of God. And along comes John, that disturber of the peace, uh, who says um, God has put his axe to the root of the tree. And don't think within yourselves, well, I'm a child of Abraham and therefore I'm automatically ready for God's things. He says, repent, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John said to many of the people of Israel, you're not in the kingdom. You're not even ready for the kingdom. Jesus here speaks of Nicodemus and he says, you can't appreciate the kingdom of God until you're, unless you're born again. Born anew, this version I've got here says, uh, perhaps you know. That the literal translation says, except one be born from above. Now, Nicodemus no doubt had had what you might call an orthodox birth, born no doubt of a Jewish mother, circumcised the eighth day, as was Paul. He'd been an earnest man, one who had kept the law as well as he could someone who had fulfilled all the expectations that the nation had. This man is evidenced by his life, by his birth, that he's a member of the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, unless you're born from above, not from, not from a Jewish mother's womb, but unless you're born from above, a man cannot see the kingdom of God. I imagine Nicodemus kind of <laughs> sitting back in his seat and saying, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? You see, that's the way that Jewish children became members of the kingdom of God. They were born from Jewish mother's wombs. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except be one born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That will come on to another question. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. He's, he's not making a contrast here between the flesh and the way that Paul does about the flesh having a propensity to temptation. Um, that isn't what he's talking about. He, he's talking simply about, well, Jesus was born of the flesh according to the seed of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Paul writes in Romans. This, this, this man had all the right qualifications to presume that he was already in the kingdom of God. But he says that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, 
Is this Jesus again resting his hand on Nicodemus' shoulder? I say of thee, I say unto thee, and then he looks round to all who are listening. You must be born again. You must be born from anew. Now, let me say something really important, I think. I often know that phrase, really important. <laughs> this is really, really important. Sometimes we use this phrase, you must be born again, in a kind of a judgmental sense. And maybe you think that's the way that Jesus was using it here. But this must be born again is not in the... In, this is... Um, this isn't in the imperative mood. This This isn't saying you pointing his finger must be born again and you and you and you and you it isn't judging and saying to a person i think that person needs to be born again he isn't that that would be in the imperative this is a straightforward statement it is necessary that you be born again it is a heavenly axiom it's not a command it's an instruction it's a revelation of fact. You must be born again. You must. You must. It's the only way of entrance into the kingdom. It's the only way of seeing the kingdom. You must be born again. The wind blows where it will, and you hear the voice thereof, and you know not whence it comes and whither it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Here's Nicodemus' next question. How can these things be? Now, Jesus has his answer to that, but there's another spirit. There's another answer, effectively. And it's the answer of the Holy Spirit. Mary answered pretty much the same, asked pretty much the same question. When she said, how can these things be? And the angel said, by the Holy Spirit, you will conceive. Now Nicodemus, an old man, asks the question and effectively Jesus gives the same answer that the angel gave to Mary. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that which we know and bear witness of that which we have not seen and all of you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you believe not, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended out of heaven. You might say that the only one on the earth at this stage that had been born from heaven was the one who was conceived in Mary's womb with a heavenly seed. The word that came from heaven became flesh. And because he's come from heaven, he says, no one has ascended up into heaven, but he that descended out of heaven, even the Son of Man who is in heaven. And then he says this, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him in the same way as the people of Israel put all their faith in that serpent. Those believers may in him have eternal life. Let's move on. These baptisms is a general statement. The leaders of the day did not accept what you have to say. But somehow the religious leaders connected baptism with a kind of a new beginning. I'll tell you why in a moment. When they spoke to John, they said, why are you baptizing if you're not the Christ? So somehow they had an expectation of baptism linked with the Christ, nor Elijah. Now, did Elijah do any baptizing? Nor that prophet. There you have this kind of 
confused interpretation of coming events. But baptism was part of it. And they're questioning John to know the significance of his baptism. Later on, it says in Luke, in John chapter 3, verse 25, there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Now, this is because John was using water in a different way to the way that the Jews continued their washings and their purifying. Let's go on to that least known about group, the Essenes. Now, the Essenes are not mentioned in the scripture, but the atmosphere of the gospel, according to John, accommodates their presence among other splinter groups. Josephus, the historian, refers to them as one of the three Jewish sects, together with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, for them, and I've put a note here, you can check it out in Wikipedia, which you know is never wrong. You can check it out. And uh, you'll find that they had lots of ritual bathing. And they had, in fact, um, a ritual bath called a mikveh, which I think synagogues are still supposed to hear, certainly amongst Orthodox Jews, because there are lots of, um, lots of purification rites that kind of take place. And actually becoming a Jew when you're a Gentile has included in it a purification rite. Pure, ritual purification was a common practice amongst the peoples of Judea during this period and was thus not specific to the Essenes. A ritual bath or the mikvah was fear found in biochemists near many synagogues of the period continuing into modern times. Now, the Essenes kind of passed out of history into history, vanished. They were celibate and they didn't have families. And But at this time, there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about baptizing. So we're not thinking about the Essenes' baptism, but what about Bab John's baptism? What was all that about, and what was its purpose? I'm going to keep it as brief as I can. This is Mark chapter 1, verse 4. Mark's record. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. John was preaching that if people responded to his baptism as a of repentance, the effect would be that their sins would be remitted, that is to say, dispatched. It tells us the same in Luke. He went into all the region around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. You see, there are other baptisms which were for ritual cleansing of one kind or another. But this baptism was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And it wasn't the baptism of the Christ, because that was yet to come in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have essentially this same statement. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And if you remember that famous event in Acts chapter 19, when Paul met some who were, had been, were uh, disciples of John, and he says to them, when you, did you receive the Spirit when you were baptized? And they said, We'd, we've not heard whether there be a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, here's his little definition, listen. John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance. We can not add for the remission of sins. That they should believe on him who would come after him. So John's baptism was always a stage towards faith in Christ. It was always so that they would believe on the coming one. Always. It was not an end in itself. John's baptism was a baptism which was part of a process, the last part of the process, in bringing people to Christ. 
And you have that wonderful little statement in the scripture where it says of some of, his, of John's disciples that they heard John speak and they followed Jesus. As far as John was concerned, that was mission accomplished. That was his mission, to speak in such a way and to administer baptism for the remission of sins so that people would believe on the coming one. So what about Jesus' disciples? Because they were Baptists, you know. Really, you say? Oh, well, yes, they were. Uh, some of them, of course, had been the followers of John the Baptist, which makes us wonder maybe whether John had other people who were baptizing as well in this same way. But certainly these two, listen, these, listen to this. This is John chapter 3 and verse 22. These things, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. And there he remained with them and baptized. What, you say? That sounds as though Jesus is baptizing. And that's how you would read it. If you didn't go on to John chapter 4 and verse 1 and 2, this is why chapter divisions are not always helpful. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, and then in brackets, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples. All right. So when these disciples were sent out to preach, it sounds as though they were baptizing as well. You look up the verses and think about it. It looks as though they were continuing the kind of ministry that John the Baptist has had but under the tutelage disciples to Jesus. <laughs> Amazing. Perhaps some of the disciples of John had probably continued his teaching and his baptism. Remember that uh, we saw recently that John forbade his disciples to witness to his messiahship and his sacrificial death. But he preached the same gospel that Jesus preached. And we have a record of the first preached words of Jesus. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus was preaching the same message as John the Baptist. So, that's John. That's the Essenes. That's John and his disciples who, it seems, continued that role, uh, even when they were disciples of Jesus. Let's have a look at Nicodemus' baptism. What I mean is the baptism that the Pharisees employed. Generally, the Pharisees rejected John's baptism. This is Luke chapter 7, verse 29. And when all the people heard him, even the tax, that's Christ actually, even the tax collectors justify God having been baptized with the baptism of John, even the inland revenue officials, even the tax collectors, justified God having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves. So it was the will of God for these men and women to be baptized and to believe on the coming one. It was the will of God, and they rejected it, not having been baptized by John. Nicodemus was a leading rabbi in Israel. He's a man of integrity and humility, as we saw from the way that the senior rabbi was willing to consult a much less senior rabbi, Jesus. One of the contexts of the early chapters of John is, as we've already seen, that context of water baptism. And John Baptist was raising a lot of interest and a mass of questions. Now, the Pharisees had a theology of regeneration and they had a practice of baptism and it had to do with the making of proselytes that's to say Gentile converts to Judaism people uh, not being crude here but people who had not come from a Jewish womb because it has long been accepted that anyone who was born from a Jewish womb is a Jew if you ask the question what is a Jew Technically, the answer is he whose mother is a Jew or one who has converted 
to Judaism. So, those who were born of Jewish mothers, they were already, as far as people like Nicodemus was concerned, already part of the kingdom of God. They had the Lord of God. They had the instructions of God in their midst. They were the people of God. They had a past. They had a present. They had a destiny. And often their pattern and their practice was based on the theology in the story of Naaman and his self-baptism in the Jordan. Naaman was a very acceptable proselyte for this reason. When Jethro, the father-in-law of Jesus, hears of the events in the wilderness and God's power in delivering the people of Israel from Egypt, Jethro says, uh, now I know that Jehovah is greater than all the gods. Now, if we take that at its face value, that's Jethro saying, I know that God is the greatest of the gods. That means that in some measure, Jethro was still um, one who recognized the existence of other gods. Naaman, on the other hand, we'll talk about his story in a moment or two, perhaps. Naaman, on the other hand, was when he was when when he immersed himself in the River Jordan seven times and he came up clean. Uh, he wanted to become a convert. He wanted to become a worshipper of Jehovah. And uh, he says, now because of his healing, he says, now I know that God is the only God. So Jethro says God is the greatest. Naaman says he's the only God. So the Jews liked, the rabbis, they liked the story of Naaman and his self-baptism. This, this, is, this is an interesting thing. This is one of the few times or one of only two times, in fact, that we have the word baptism in the Old Testament, where you say, well, it's, well, it's in that Septuagint again. In the story of Naaman in the Septuagint, it, it says that he, he was told to go and wash in the Jordan, and that it, it goes on to say that he was, uh, that he dipped himself seven times in the River Jordan, and in the Septuagint, that is the word baptizo. And it's used in a particular way which shows that, in fact, he baptized himself. Which is actually what Jewish proselytes today do, as far as I understand. They're not baptized, they self-immerse. They baptize themselves. They're not baptized by another agent, another person, a uh, John. Um, or anybody like this, they baptize themselves. So, to become a true member of the kingdom of God, a Gentile has to submit to self-baptism. He has to take on the burden of the law. He becomes part of the law-keeping people. He makes a sacrifice at the temple, which is now often a kind of a charitable gift, and he has to be baptized. He baptizes himself. So, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 10, Elisha sent a message to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan, that's the washing word, seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. That is the purification element. So he went down and baptized himself seven times in the Jordan. It switches the word. He baptized himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. There it is. He was clean. So what happened then to a Gentile proselyte who had submitted to these three things, that he had uh, he'd taken on the commitment to keep the law, he had made a charitable offering in lieu of a sacrifice at the temple and he has baptized himself in water just the once i think well for gentile proselytes entrance into the kingdom of god a, pro a full proselyte or proselytes of righteousness as they were called became they became children of the covenant 
perfect Israelites. They became, as a result of their proselytization and its final ceremonies, they became perfect Israelites. They became Israelites in every respect, both as regarding dues and duties and privileges. The rabbis taught that as he stepped out of these waters, the proselyte was considered as born anew in the language of the rabbis, as it were a little child just born as a day of one, a child of one day. And maybe you remember that it says specifically, Naaman's flesh came new like the flesh of a little child. The proselyte was to regard himself as a new man in reference to his past. Country, home, habits, friends, relationships were all changed. The past, with all that had belonged to it, was past, and he was a new man. The old, with its defilements, was buried and washed away in the waters of baptism. We commented earlier, I think, in one of these studies, that when this was carried out, the logic of the Pharisees was such that it, it determined questions of inheritance. You now became fully part of that tribe, that group, except for the sake of not bringing proselytism into contempt. They said that a proselyte was legally entitled to marry his own mother or his sister. But because it would bring proselytism into contempt, the rabbis forbid it, but they believed that it was legally permissible. In other words, this man has been born again. Baptize, baptism, according to the rabbis, brought a convert into the covenant community and made him a full partner in the kingdom of God. They saw the records of Noah's flood, Moses' crossing of the Red Sea, and the baptizing of Naaman as crucial breaks with the past. Each one of these had a before and an after. It was an introduction to a new world. And we've touched these on past studies. To me, it's almost as though with each of these events, baptism of a proselyte and these records of Noah's flood, Moses' crossing the Red Sea, Naaman, you could have said, all things have passed away. All things are become new. Which is the consequence of new birth from above. But Jewish proselyte baptism can't affect these things. It's only by water and the Holy Spirit. We'll come on to that later. So, no doubt it was with these perplexing questions in mind that Nicodemus respectfully greeted the younger rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, and he said, we know you're a teacher come from God. And we know that Jesus spoke to him and said, well, what's necessary is a birth that is from above. This, is, this really is an amazing passage of Scripture. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. We can see just from the story just how devastating this was to Nicodemus' theology because he would have believed in proselyte baptism. That it was possible for someone who was not born of the spirit but who was actually adopted into the family of Israel to inherit all the privileges and the responsibility of being a part of the people of God, the kingdom of God. But Christ expounds the bold statements of a birth that has a heavenly origin. There's no way to progress from the natural to the spiritual. Natural birth can never evolve into spiritual birth. There must be a brand new beginning. And this will always have an element of the mysterious in it. The spirit is like the wind. You feel the impact, but you cannot map the route it took to get to you, nor predict where it will lead. He struggles to get a hold of the concept. 
You could almost hear the pain in his voice. How can these things be? He's already received his answer. To the profound questions of how a man comes to regeneration, there is a simple but sometimes frustrating answer, the Holy Spirit. Mary had asked a similar question of the angel messenger and received a very similar answer. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, seeing I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore that Holy One is to be born and will be called the Son of God. It might well be frustrating to human intellect that loves to enclose things in boxes with clear labels. But this is the true explanation, and the only one that God will give by my spirit. I think we've said enough about these baptisms. Next time, God willing, we'll take a look at born of water and the spirit. We'll look at this phrase of Jesus and see if we can understand what it meant in its day for Nicodemus and what it means for us in our day. All right, God willing, I look forward to your company. Next time, same place, same time. God willing, God bless you.